Hello Rebel and welcome back to my life. Here's the thing about Hank fucking Green. Hank recently released a book, A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor. It is a sequel to his first book, An Absolutely Remarkable Thing. So longtime viewers of the channel will know that I became aware of Hank Green in 2014 when somebody recommended his YouTube channel to me because apparently I sound a lot like him. I've always thought I sound a lot more like his brother John, but I do act and think a lot more like Hank. He was much better at YouTube than I was. And he remains that way. That was always fine, though. I'm not a YouTuber. I'm an author who also does YouTube. So it was totally fine to me to have somebody out there who was much better at doing the YouTube than I was because, hey, I had my writing. And okay, yeah, I still technically have my writing. It's just really irritating when Hank comes out with a pair of books that are just... This friggin' good. So this is gonna be a video review of Hank's book, A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor. It's really good, I just have to say that right off the top, but also right off the top, I have to disclose a couple of things. I'm not able to give this book a fully objective review, as though such a thing exists, but no, really, like, particularly in my case. I read early drafts of Hank's book, An Absolutely Remarkable Thing. Hank is a supporter of mine on Patreon, and his literary agent is also my literary agent. So know all of those things before you watch my review. All of that being said, ha, this is a really good book. It's a really good pair of books. Both of them are just real good. Hank released both of these books in the last couple of years, and this is it. This is the whole story. It's not continuing. It's not going to be a trilogy. It's not going to be a series. Hank calls it a duology. I've never really heard that term, and I don't really feel like Googling it. I'm just going to take him at his word that it's a thing, and yeah. It's a really good duology. I really wanted to do a deep dive on Abfi. That's what I'm calling it. You can't stop me. I wanted to do like a full in-depth review, breaking down every single thing in it and the themes and all the thoughts that I had about it. However, July's video creation has already gotten way, way, way out of hand and out of my control and I need to cut things short. So instead, what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna flip through to all of the notes that I highlighted in the book and I'm gonna talk about the ones that I wanna talk about. And then I'm gonna cut all that together, except probably not all of it, because there's a lot of it, because I made so many notes, so many notes, so many notes notes while I was reading this book. It's a lot of notes. So the very first thing I highlighted in the book is on the very first page of the book, and it's when the protagonist, April May, is talking about the different types of lying. And she says, the second kind of lie is the kind you don't care if you get caught telling. The lying might help avoid some negative outcome, but really it's a tool for weakening reality and thus strengthening yourself. This points out something that I really like in the book overall, which is that honestly, I felt like an absolutely remarkable thing was a little wishy-washy in terms of declaring a moral stance. That's that sounds harsh and I don't mean it to be. I don't mean to say that an absolutely remarkable thing has no moral stance, no moral center, and has no moral message. It absolutely has all of those things. I just felt that for me personally, it went a little too far into both sides-ism. Like the book continually tried to remind you like, hey, our side isn't perfect either. Even though they're worse, like pay attention to us as well. And, and, and th 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 there's nothing wrong with that, okay? I wanna, I wanna stress that. There's nothing wrong with being self-reflective, looking at your own side and seeing what you're doing wrong and how you can do it better. It's just that taken to an extreme, you can kind of shoot yourself in the foot when what you should really be doing is trying to, you know, do something to improve the world if that's what you're all about. Anyway, a beautifully foolish endeavor, while also being more morally ambiguous, we'll talk about that later, also comes down a lot harder on the side of, no, but there is a right side and a right answer and we need to do that. This one doesn't have some big, deep philosophical thought behind it, but I just really thought it was a great line. We all only have our own lives to live inside of. That is very true. We really only know what one person's life experience is completely. And problems that we have in our lives don't not exist just because other people have problems too, or even worse ones. A character in the book is talking about the dedications that are published at the front of books and lists as an example, this one's for my patient and loving wife, Catherine. Of course, Hank's dedication in his book is for my patient and loving wife, Catherine. <laughs> I see what you did there. There's a line here that's a reference to the end of the last book, where one character doesn't know what to do after the climax of the first story, and he gets an opportunity to go out and talk to people, and he asks his friend whether he should. And she asks him, can you tell them something that will make them feel better? I kind of thought that was just really pretty. Like, that's not the only thing that you should try to do with a platform, but it is something I feel like you should do with a platform. There are so many things in the world that are actively trying to make people feel worse, and in many cases they are succeeding, so like, there's nothing wrong with making people feel better. On the same page, I wasn't really me. Famous people never are. Yeah. Yeah. If you've read an absolutely remarkable thing, you know that that is a central, common, extremely important thread running through both books. The idea that famous people are not what we think they are. They have their own internal lives, they have their own problems, they have their own successes, they have a completely different way of thinking about the world than the presentation that we are given. What we have in our heads is essentially a brand. Sometimes that brand is intentionally created by the famous person, sometimes it is something we have put on them. It is always different than what is really going on 
on on the other side of the camera, book, whatever. So one of the characters in the book is talking on a podcast about like what he's trying to do with his life now, and he refers to Hamilton in the song The Room Where It Happens, and he says, Nowadays, I don't so much want to be in the room where it happens, but I do really want to help other people choose the right rooms and help them realize that they really are a part of things that matter. Because when we feel like none of the rooms we are in matter, that's when we're really lost. One thing about both of Hank's books, there are a lot of lines that are clearly autobiographical, a lot of storylines, themes, and plots that are clearly taken very heavily from Hank's own personal experience. There are, there are moments where, especially being a longtime viewer of Hank's and somebody who just thinks he's a really cool guy, I feel like in this line, he's just looking up out of the page at me and saying those words to me. That's cool. That's not a universal experience. Not everybody is going to have that. If you don't know anything about Hank or Vlogbrothers or uh, the social internet, you're not really gonna get that same experience. And so from a review perspective, and I'm not really a professional book reviewer, but from a review perspective, that is a thing to know. I feel like both books are better the better you already know Hank. But this line and another line that I highlighted on the next page both get to a very central theme in both books that is al also something that's very important to me and that I've thought a lot about and spent a lot of time talking about and have actually discussed on this channel. The same character is talking about with people losing a clear path and the economy losing steam, all of these things seemed worse than ever. I wanted to make things better and sometimes that meant I wanted to shout hot takes into the void but I also had no idea if that would actually help. These two lines together present an idea that I, I really do feel is a, a central viewpoint and thought and like a common thread in the zeitgeist of my generation, which is also Hank's generation. And it is that we don't know what to do about so many things, maybe about anything but we know that we have to do something. And that is so important and it is also devastatingly precarious. It is such a dangerous position to be in. It is so easy to be or to at least feel undermined when, when you know that you have to act and you don't know exactly what the right action is and so you go out and take action anyway and you are criticized for it because you already knew that you didn't have the right answer. So anybody saying that what you did was wrong eats away at you so much more because they are agreeing with something that you already thought in the first place. This kind of relates to the first topic that I raised. And again, I, I don't think that the solution is to not care about criticism or not pay attention when other people say that you were doing things wrong. I just, I, I think it's important to be aware of. I think it's something that we need to keep in mind that, that we don't know what to do, but we know that we have to do something because doing nothing is the only thing worse than doing something wrong. All right, all right, we gotta move through this book a little bit faster. I'm seriously so behind this month, it's not even funny. From a strictly science fiction perspective, I love this line. It's talking about the existence of aliens, and it says, they existed when Jesus was born and when the first person spoke the first word. This is, this is so cool because when we discover extraterrestrial life, we are going to have to reconcile with the fact that it's always been there. They're, they're, we're not going to discover brand new life that was created since we started wondering about it. Assuming that it does exist out there somewhere, and in the grand scope of the universe, it's a near certainty that it does. It's, it's already there. It's there right now. It was there from the very beginning of everything, from, from people thinking and becoming people. Like, it's just been there. That's a really cool thought. Again, just from a straight sci-fi perspective. I just love that. All right, so in this story world where major events have changed the shape of human society on planet Earth, there is an aftermath. And the character is talking about this when he says, it's not that the new stories are worse, it's just that we haven't had time to settle on any good ones, and so now many of us are adrift. So again, this ties back into that major theme I was just talking about, and I feel like this is such a, a good encapsulation of where we're at right now. We are, importantly and necessarily, throwing away a bunch of cultural mythology and things that we have been told our whole lives and told were true and made to believe and we're just throwing it all out the window. That's a good thing, because these things that we're throwing out the window include myths of racial superiority and and discrimination is okay and all that kind of crap. Like, we shouldn't have that. But those stories, wrong and incorrect and bigoted as they were, they gave people stability. They gave people a narrative to believe in that justified the way the world was and their place within it. And now we're like, but wait, if all that's not true, then what am life? Again, it kind of comes down to, we don't know. 
what to do. But we know that we have to do something. And yeah, eventually we will kind of settle down on the story that makes sense to us, that we all or that most people agree is the right story. It won't be the perfect story. It just won't. Like, maybe one day the perfect story will be discovered, but I'm just saying, like, in this current round of refreshing the cultural mythology, I just don't think it's gonna happen. Alright, so speaking about the whole subject of online discourse, a uh, character says, And getting on these people's bad side is unpleasant because of how they believe very strongly that being a dick is a vital part of making the world a better place. And hell, who knows, maybe they're right. So this again goes back to that issue of sort of, like, both siderisms that I like was one of my few very small problems with an absolutely remarkable thing. It wasn't like super prevalent or throughout the whole story, but there were moments in the first book where it was a little bit like, hey, just being an asshole or, or being mean or rude to other people is just kind of always wrong and kind of never the right way to go about things. I think that generally we should be nice and generally we should be good to other people and everything, but like there are people who I don't think that applies to. So it's just nice to see to see this book be like, hey, you know what? Who? How do I know any better than you? As a side note, I said in a tweet when I finished this book a few days ago, Hank poses very real problems and is way too smart to try to provide solutions. I stand by that very firmly because everybody's solution is going to be different because everybody's problem is going to be slightly different. And I think there is value in talking about problems and proposing possible solutions, but acknowledging that everybody is going to come at this a different way from a different angle and with a different background. And being like, hey, you're going to have to be the one to figure out what works for you. I can I can talk about the problem with you, but I am not going to be able to dictate what you should do to fix it. All right, back to the book here. There is one line here that I have a major problem with. All research is supposed to be additive and science doesn't actually work in breakthroughs the way we're all taught. That should not say research and science. That should say progress and culture. All progress is supposed to be additive and that culture doesn't actually work in breakthroughs the way we're all taught. Yeah, like great books, plays, songs, developments in critical thinking, none of that comes in a vacuum or with huge breakthroughs either. That is also built off of the stuff that comes before it. Just in case it wasn't totally clear, this is not a real gripe. Obviously, I'm just like, that's a very good point. And it just applies to more than science is all I'm saying. Here's your existential crisis for the day. Satisfaction sounds lovely, but evolutionarily it was apparently selected against. Why would you say something so worldview destroying and yet so brave? I, I have just, I have just never encountered anything in a book that was so relatable and instantly recognizable as true and so depressing at the same time. One line here has a deeply personal meaning to me. The character says, often restraint is far more remarkable than action. One time I got very upset about something, very, very upset about something. And I, I, I know that this has nothing to do with the actual uh, content of the book and that this was not an influence on it in any way. But for some reason I emailed Hank about it because I needed to email somebody about it. And Hank was really one of the only people in the world who could understand what I was saying and why I was upset about it. And in the end, after writing an email that was way too long and way too emotional, I decided not to do anything about the thing that I was upset about. And my life and the world is better because I decided not to do anything about it. And the combination of factors, the combination of that thing happening and because I had emailed Hank about it immediately made me think of it when I was reading this book and so that was just that was a nice little personal journey. Hank never responded to that email by the way. He gets a lot of them and so like it makes sense, you know, yeah, like I never expect a response from somebody like him but like it probably also made the world better that he didn't answer me in a very upset time in my life. <laughs> Here's another one that's just like woof to me. There's no way to stimulate an economy that people simply don't seem interested in participating in. Very true. Very frightening in today's day and age. Wouldn't it be great if, if somebody, anybody, I don't care who it is, if somebody could just give us like a goal as a whole society that everybody got on board with, something that made us all go, yeah, yeah, okay, all right, fine. I'll pitch in on that. Not to spoil the ending of the book or anything. Okay, so another quick aside as I'm going through the book and just suddenly sort of thinking of this. If I have one major problem or downside of this book, here's what it is. The book praises or seems to be in favor of collective action without ever really like 
demonstrating it in the story itself. That's not true. Not without ever demonstrating it within the story itself. Collective action does happen in a myriad of ways, but it is not ultimately the solution of the problems that the story presents. Whereas in the first book, it was entirely the solution to the problems that the story presents. The whole first book is essentially one gigantic mystery that the main characters keep trying to solve on their own. Well, most of the main characters anyway, but they keep trying to solve it by themselves, separate from everybody else. And the mystery remains unsolvable until they finally are like, okay, everybody, everybody pitch in, let's do this. And that is how they solve every problem. Everybody coming together and figuring it all out together. That's a lot less in this book. Again, not entirely absent, but a lot less than the first one. It really does come down to the main characters and their action and their leadership driving the story forward and solving the problems of the plot. And it also doesn't super help that like the main characters who go and lead the way and solve the problems are all you know, rich or well off, mostly white kids from like upper class families who are way even more upper class now that they're like international stars. It's, that's not great. Although the ultimate problem in the end is solved by the largest collective action that Earth has ever seen. L literally, it, it, it's not it, it's my least favorite thing about the book, but it's not that big of a deal, honestly. <laughs> this was always the way of these strong men. They would craft the fear so carefully and then toss it into the world for everyone to use. And when someone took that fear and destroyed with it, they were just unstable or mentally ill again. Hank is just a little more explicit in this book about like, no, like there are actual bad guys. They're right over there. It's them. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, I, I just appreciate that. So there's an emoji in the book that does more heavy lifting than some entire sentences. And it's this. It's a conversation where Andy contradicts himself and then Robin points out the contradiction and then Andy just shrug emoji. If that isn't an eternal mood, do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I contain multitudes. Okay, again, really quotable lines. And as a side note, it would be really difficult for me to isolate my favorite line in the book. Like John recently made a video about the book and he just said his favorite line. Like, this is just my favorite line. And I had already highlighted that line, but I was like, wait, 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 favorite, favorite. There, there are so many good lines in the book vis-a-vis the world is too complex for there to be good reasons for any truly great decision. I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, this nerd confused. I, 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 Hank, you make me mad. I, I've never put a line that good down in a book and I probably never will. So this was a thing that I highlighted and then I took a slightly more detailed note down elsewhere. So in the first book, April May goes about creating her personal brand when she's going to be doing YouTube and podcasts and stuff, talking about the Carls that have suddenly appeared all over the world. And her big idea, her main thrust is that the Carls are scary and unknown. So she is going to be cute and hot, frankly, and relatable. She is going to be safe where the Carls appear to be dangerous. Hank does that with his writing. I didn't spot it until this book, but it's it fucking, it's clever. It's clever. Th th this book is scary. Not in the horror sense, not with monsters or ghosts or things that are gonna kill you. It is scary in a much bigger, much more realistic, much more existential way. This book makes you afraid of the way that human society currently is and the way that it's going and how fast it's going there. And just when you're really freaked out and not sure what to do about it and not sure that you're having fun with the experience, Hank throws in a line like, because it's unpredictable, the monkey made a flourish with their hands as they said it, I was not amused. That's in the middle of being scared. And it's like, hey, hey, I know we're talking about some tough stuff here, I know that we're discussing difficult subjects that are hard to think about. Jazz hands. <laughs> Humor is safe and relatable when reality is scary, even if reality isn't real. This is not even like an actual salient point or topic of conversation. I just want to say that the end of the chapter that ends on page 229 fucked me up. Just, it just did. Focusing on efficiency for the sake of fewer and fewer powerful people would make us more vulnerable to shocks from catastrophes, both expected and unexpected. Or as John Green likes to say, of all the communists I know, Hank likes money the most. Hank and John both appear to actively and intentionally defy simplification when it comes to pigeonholing them in the way that they think about various issues, including economics and politics. Like on certain things like, you know, trans rights and whatnot, they're, they're very clear and on a side that I agree with. On other things, they're less clear. And as this book and their whole online discussion talks about, clarity is nice and feels safe 
but it's not accurate. So it's it's good that they are complex and nuanced in their discussions of these things to the point where you can't just say, oh, they're this or oh, they're that. But at the same time, it's very nice to occasionally see a line, whether in a Vlogbrothers video or in a book like this, that just says like, hey, just, just to be clear, Capitalism isn't like all it's cracked up to be. We're all aware of that, right? Right, right? Okay, good, carry on. There's a bunch of lines that I highlighted just because they make me laugh. They were holding a fucking laser pointer. It is BTS and the Sistine Chapel and Rumi's poetry and Ross Geller on the stairs yelling, PIVOT! <laughs> it was good, it was good, it was good. Another thing Hank is generally good at, and it's certainly clear in this book, is pointing out inherent contradictions that exist within people and within society as a whole. And again, related to what I was talking about earlier, when Hank points out these contradictions, he's never so foolish as to say, and this is the side that's right. B because it's not, it, it it's not correct. Neither one of them is necessarily 100% correct. That's for you to deal with. <laughs> One thing both books seem to be thinking about a lot is abuse and what happens after and people who hurt us and how we deal with that in our lives. Somebody who is hurt very badly by another character in the first book says in reference to that person, I need to hear some words I haven't heard yet. And of course, we're meant to infer that it's words of apology or love or something, something to fix what was done. Everybody reads differently. I interpreted this as an admission that this character doesn't actually even know what words she needs to hear. She knows that she hasn't heard the right words yet to make everything better, but she maybe doesn't know what those words would be, or even if they really exist. That's just, that's just very realistic. And I like that a lot, because I, I think it reflects reality pretty well. Hey, Hank, I know you didn't know this when you wrote this, so what the fuck, man? All of this will make humanity less able to handle unlikely but ultimately inevitable catastrophes, especially if they compound a war on top of an unstable climate on top of a pandemic, for example. The fuck, Hank? The fuck? Did I, did I take baths in the giant soaking tub with a view of both the Hudson and the East River and everything in between? Yes, but I had complicated thoughts about structural inequality while I did it. I, I mean... Are you, are you like trying to call out your base? Because I think you did. And just so there's no confusion, I'm totally including myself in that crowd. Yeah, I will totally sit around at a high class winery drinking $60 a bottle of wine while discussing income inequality and racial oppression. It's not great, but like... I contradict myself. Hang Green Communist strikes again. Well, yeah, I mean, have you met capitalism? The whole idea of everything is to reward people who create value, and yet... And a little later in the same conversation, an open market rewards people who work hard and think critically at first, but once real value is at stake, the market rapidly transforms to reward those with access to capital. Huh! Funny how these words might come from one of the earliest YouTubers who literally just kind of lucked into becoming one of the biggest people on the platform, only to see other people come in and kind of take the platform for their own. Funny how something like that might happen. Only a couple of pages later, one day an internet company wants to sell books and then 10 years later they're a threat to nearly every industry on earth. Huh. Hank seems to share my discomfort at how much money we both make from Amazon. Hank, I really have a bone to pick with you with how important you made Justin Bieber in this book. Like, what? No. Mm-mm. A bridge too far. Much like the first book, Hank leaves a little, like, trail of breadcrumbs for you to follow across the internet if you choose to. Like, there are a bunch of Twitter handles listed in the books in conversations that are happening between, like, apparently randos on the internet, and I have gone and followed every single one of them. These are not big people. These are not big celebrities. These are, like, random people whose Twitter handles Hank liked, and now they've got followers just from the book. Now, from what I can tell, Hank asked their permission before putting them in his book, but still, it's a little strange and I kind of love it. I also have a Beautifully Foolish Endeavor YouTube playlist with all of the songs that are listed in the book in order. Very strange, very strange mix of music. Very strange, but I like it. Communist Hank Green strikes again. If this product was here to revolutionize the way we learn and think and interact, it was going to do it for rich people first. Yeah. Yeah, that's usually how it goes. People love to talk about like, oh, you just have to be an early adopter. Oh, you just have to get in on the ground floor. Well, well, guess who can do that? Guess who can afford the time and money and sometimes risk to do that? People who are already rich or not even like rich, rich, but like advantaged in some way, like, you know, came from that. Well, you get the idea. This might be my favorite line in the book. One of the most powerful traits of your system is how ardently you believe in your individuality while simultaneously operating almost entirely as a collective. Fuck, Hank. 
No, I think I found it. I think I found my favorite line in the book. I just wanted to feel important. I didn't want to, like, be important. Ah, oh, that line physically hurt me when I read it. It, it, like, it encapsulates so, so much. It's a big problem with modern online culture, which Hank is, to one degree or another, always thinking and talking about. Um... But boy, it actually like it actually still like hits me a little bit, you know. This was an interesting thing to read from Hank, and it's also something that I completely agree with. The tools of the internet promised to connect us, but they have just been further surrogates for real connection. Does that mean they are bad? No, a surrogate is not immediately bad, but it cannot be the be all end all. That is the thing. I feel like we get in trouble with internet connection and internet culture, when we use it as a complete substitution of real life. It can be a good thing. The connections I've made on the internet have dramatically increased my life and the lives of others, including my family. But it is not everything. I do not think this is a computer problem. I think that it is a human problem. We seek the safety of isolation even as it kills us. Yeah, this is a good book, and you should read it. Another one of those moments where Hank is, like, pretty clearly taking a side on an issue. Call me a pessimist, but I think if bigotry could be solved by access to more information, it would have been solved by now. Hate isn't about a lack of understanding. It's about hate. And what's going to keep you from just visiting the minds you find most comfortable? This felt like an old story, and once again, no one was going to listen. I've been having that conversation with a lot of people um, for years, actually. Kind of important. Kind of really glad to see somebody else say it so plainly and so well. It's not a matter of not understanding. People are like, well, you're not even trying to understand the other side. I, I, I do understand the other side. If I didn't understand them, I would be more reticent to oppose them. I understand exactly how dangerous the other side is. And if they're not dangerous, then they're not the other side to me. Any anyway, anyway. All right, here's another really, really good top line in this book. If you're trying to live right and good and correct, it's slow and complicated and scary. But if you just need to get something done, you can do whatever you want. Here's a scary thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently. I, I do think that there is a culture war happening, and I am worried that the wrong side is going to win. As you know, uh, if you've watched me, and even just from watching this video, I place myself pretty firmly on one side of the culture war. I self-identify as being on that side of the culture war. But I think that the culture war is not going to be won by the people with the best ideas or the most well-crafted opinions. It is going to be won by attrition. Because I'm afraid that that is how human beings work. I'm afraid that when we hear the same thing so many times, over and over and over again, no matter the quality of the communication, but the same idea from enough mouths, we start to believe it. And the side that I am on, which I believe is the right side, is careful and takes time to craft our messages and make sure that we are expressing ourselves correctly. But for the other side, which I do believe is the wrong side, it is so easy to churn out videos and articles and books non-stop saying the same thing over and over again. And who cares if you say it correctly because everyone who's listening to you knows what you really mean. Much like Hank, I present this problem to you with no solution. Have fun! Power is just a lack of constraint. It's just ability and desire without restriction. Boy. Boy, is that true. And boy, is that a unique and different way of thinking about privilege. Think about privilege strictly in terms of that way of thinking about power and, like, a lot more things become a lot more understandable. Still bad, but understandable. This entire passage is amazing. It's on pages 374 to 375. Like, both of those pages together are just like the most beautiful essay. I'm definitely, definitely going to make a YouTube video about them in the future. But I, I, I guess I'll just like take a small selection here. Some people, and I consider myself one of them, study their want, refine it, and build an engine that burns it. Even if their want pushes all in one direction, they can tack against it like a sailboat, getting somewhere better than where they wanted to be. I know my want. I know that big well inside of me is never going to get filled. I know that life is not about actually satisfying the want. It's about using it. Fuck me dead, Hank! Oh, so uh, this, is, this is one of those lines that I was talking about that feels like very super autobiographical where like Hank is just like staring out of the page saying these words to you. But it's also like, it, it's also like he's in my friggin' head!
It's it's like I've had this this thought. These things, these sentences have presented this. Yes, so much me. Anyway, that's another one that's like personally important to me. Doesn't necessarily gonna resonate with everybody out there. That's fine. This is John's favorite line in the whole book. You will always struggle with not feeling productive until you accept that your own joy can be something you produce. It is not the only thing you will make, nor should it be, but it is something valuable and beautiful. Well, as soon as we're all done crying, we will uh, carry on. Uh, by the way, just as a side, like, review note, that series of twists that come at the end of the book, they're very good, and, like, I saw some of them coming, I did not see others coming. It, 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 Hank writes, Hank writes good books so far. First, at some point, we have to realize that the places where we share information are not services we use, they are places where we live. Uh, Hank's been talking about this a lot, and this is actually one of my favorite things about having authors be YouTubers, because, like, Hank and John have talked about the stuff that's in their last books. Everything that's in Hank's first and so far only two books is all stuff he's been talking about on YouTube, like, for a really long time, given context and place into a greater narrative framework that helps you understand it better. And same with the last two books, at least, that John has put out, uh, The Fault in Our Stars and Turtles All the Way Down, they contain a lot of his YouTube thoughts. And th this is so true. And again, might be something that might fly over the head of or be lost on somebody who hasn't been watching Hank for years and years. That's neither entirely a good thing nor entirely a bad thing, but if you're watching this video to determine whether you will like a beautifully foolish endeavor, that's something that you should be thinking about. Love this one. Power concentrates naturally, but that concentration is, by itself, a problem. One tiny group of people will not be in charge of the future. Yeah, man. Like, yeah, Hank Green communist. And that's it. Those are all the notes that made me feel like I had something to discuss in this video. As I said, it's a good book and you should read it. And the first one, obviously, don't read this one without having read the first one. That will not, it is not one of those books where you can do that. I will definitely be making a lot more videos about thoughts from this book. There, there are too many things. There are too many things that I had too many feelings about not to talk about it more. But in the meantime, yeah, uh, like Hank on the off chance that you actually end up seeing this video, you did a thing, dude. You you did a thing. And that is all I've got for you today, Rebel. I want to give a special shout out to my patrons who make this and all of my YouTube videos possible. They also get extra Underrealm content every Friday when, when I'm writing a book. I'm on a little break right now. But hey, new Underrealm stuff should be coming to my Patreon next Friday, so there's never been a better time to become a patron other than, like, you know, a few months ago. Because, like, I could use the extra money. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next Friday. Bye!